Good evening, family. Welcome this evening to Bible Way Community Baptist Church, the place where Jesus Christ is the Lord of all and the Word of God still transform life. We're excited and delighted that you have tuned in this evening, ladies and gentlemen, to be a part of our Wednesday night Bible study. And we hope and pray that you have had a real good day and you have had a real good week in the Lord. You know, when you put God first, then everything else just fall in place. If your life just seemed to be falling apart, pray about it. I say pray about it. You know, I used to always say, and I, and I got to start saying it again. Uh, if you take time and hem your day up in prayer, it won't easily come unravel. Hem your day up in prayer. Take some time and hem it up in prayer. You know what I'm talking about when I say a hem, don't you? You know, uh, ladies have a hem in their dress. Men's even have a hem in their pants. Yeah, yeah. If, if you would just hem it up in prayer, whatever you got going on that day, take some time. To, a lot of times people be in such a hurry, they, they are so busy, they don't have time to pray and their lives and just, just come falling apart, just unravel. But if you take some time and put some prayer with it, then I guarantee you it won't be easily unravel. All right, well, let's go on and get started in our Bible study time this evening. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you and we do praise you for who you are, the God who hear and you still answer prayers. Speak to our hearts this evening in a mighty, mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, all right. Uh, we've been studying about the church, the most important thing on this earth, because this is the bride of Christ. Yes, the church is the bride of Christ. Now, on our last two lessons, we looked at the role of the elder in the Old Testament. We looked at the role of the elder in the New Testament. Tonight, I want to look at the qualifications of an elder. Who can be an elder in the church of God? Who can be an elder in the local church? That's what we're going to try to uh, figure out tonight. Well, we don't have to try to uh, come up with some qualifications on our own. The Bible gives us the qualifications of an elder. Yes, yes, the qualifications of an elder found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, the first seven verses, those are the qualifications of an elder. Those are the qualifications of an elder. Look right here in your Bible. It says, if a man desire the office of a bishop, that word bishop basically uh, can mean elder. It can also mean pastor. They use these uh, names uh, interchangeably. Uh, and so, um, uh, you can say a bishop, you can say an elder, you can say a pastor, you can say an overseer, you can say a shepherd. If he desire to be a bishop, he desires a good work. And then the bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, and we'll read all of that. But, but, but I want you to see... Ten positive commands out of 1 Timothy, chapter 3. I want you to see five negative commands. And then I want you to see three illustrations. All right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at ten positive commands, five negative commands, and three illustrations. All right. Well, let's get busy. I done told you where I'm going. Now, let's get going. All right. All right. So... Uh, this is a true saying. If a man desires, 
an office of the bishop, he desires a good work, then he must be blameless. That's the first qualification that I see, blameless. He must be blameless. And that word we're talking about above reproach, uh, to have uh, nothing or no accusations against this person, you know. And, and so uh, he's a blameless person. We didn't say a sinless person, but we're saying a blameless person. In other words, he can't have no outstanding sins in his life. Outstanding sins, you know, stuff that would disqualify him like uh, a, a womanizer. Man, that guy's a, a womanizer. Uh, he's a drug addict or uh, an alcoholic or uh, something like that. Uh, he, he must be blameless. Nobody can point the finger at him and blame him. All right. Then the second thing, it, it, he must be a man. Must be a man. Uh, you, you get that in verse 1 and 2. It says this is a true sin. If a man, and the word in the Greek means not mankind, it means man. If a male desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. And so it's got to be a man. It's got to be a man. He's got to be the husband of one wife. Now, he also got to be a man because uh, if it was a woman, that would violate scripture of what Paul had already talked about back up in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 11. And 12, it says, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Now, don't tip out the room here because we're in some uh, uh, deep waters. When it says, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, it's not saying that she's got to be like a quiet church mouse and she can't say anything in the church because uh, we got to compare scripture with scripture. Because Paul says over then in uh, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 11, it's okay for the lady to uh, prophesy. She can prophesy there in church. And so if she can prophesy and she can pray, uh, he's not talking about uh, uh, just total silence. But she can't say anything new. No, he's talking in the context of an elder. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. A lot of times people, and even some churches today, they don't want women to say anything. No, no, you're going to the extreme. That's why everything must be interpreted within its context. The context here is dealing with eldership. Uh, now, he says, but I suffer not a woman to teach not to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about worship service. We're talking about worship. We're not talking about Sunday school. No, a woman, she can teach in Sunday school. A woman can teach um, uh, women's ministry and what have you. Uh, we're talking uh, about being the head teacher in the church, in other words, the elder, the pastor, the, the ruling position. This is what he's talking about. Uh, being, because we, we learned earlier, uh, the role of an elder is an elder has to be a ruler. An uh, elder is a ruler. Paul says, I, I don't put a woman in that uh, position. See, the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about responsibility. We're talking about responsibility. I remember when I was a little boy, men took pride in doing things for a lady. Oh, yeah, they took pride in doing things for a lady. You never really saw a woman pump gas at a gas station. I never saw a woman 
uh, when I was a little boy, uh, uh, get air in the tie at the gas station. I never saw her raise her hood up and pour water in the radiator. Why is that? Because whenever a man was around, whether that man knew that woman, not knew that woman, that man took the responsibility. And, and what has happened today upon the women's lib, ladies and gentlemen, uh, ladies done got the short end of the stick. Yeah, they done got the short end of the stick because today uh, you see ladies in combat boots. I mean, ladies now are going out on maneuvers in their arm and, and all of that. They say that that's progress, but in one sense, ladies didn't have to work that hard. That's what I'm trying to say. It used to be men's used to man up. See. If you uh, start going forward, lady, and you start acting like you don't need a man, then a man will just move on out the way. He'll just let you do, he'll let you pick up heavy stuff. He'll let you pick up heavy stuff. When I was a little boy, uh, that was the man. When my mom and them made the groceries and stuff, us kids went and got it. My mama didn't have to worry about uh, picking up the groceries. And man, that was a man responsibility. That was a man's job, ladies and gentlemen. And, and, and uh, when it comes to being an, an elder, and we saw the hard work of an elder last week. See, we just looking at the preaching. Uh, what that is a lot of time, that's, that's a lot of show business. Yeah, what you see on Sunday morning. The real work of an elder a lot of time is from Monday through Saturday. Yeah, you don't see a lot of that, but that's the real job of an elder. And God didn't put that heavy load. He didn't put that heavy load on the woman. Now, the, the woman is putting that heavy load on herself if she want to do that. Yeah. But God didn't ask her to do that. Uh, look right here in the text. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, Paul is a male chauvinist. That's what Paul is. Paul is a male chauvinist. And matter of fact, this is a culture thing. This is a culture thing. Uh, you know, that's how it was in Paul's day. But today, ladies are progressives. Ladies are progressives. Ladies got uh, are some of the most educated. Matter of fact, the woman today in America, she's the most educated uh, a person in America. Yeah, you got more ladies uh, going to college than you do men. You got more ladies coming out with degrees than men. Uh, you got even ladies today that's going to Bible college and seminaries and stuff like that. So uh, since, since these ladies are such educated, then we, uh, they qualify, they qualify, they qualify for the ministry. No, no, no. Paul is not looking so much at culture. He ain't looking at education. He's looking at creation. How did God set it up from the beginning? Look right here, look right here. Verse number 13 and 14, for Adam, was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in trans transgression. See, God always recognized the firstborn. Yeah, the firstborn, you know, always get, you know, double blessings and things like that and what have you. Um, and Adam was formed first. And so God made him head. Now keep in mind who was the smartest woman that ever lived. The smartest woman that ever lived was Eve, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, because Eve was created without sin. She didn't have a depraved mind. Uh, she didn't have a contaminated mind. It wasn't until she sinned that sin entered into her heart. But before sin entered into her heart, uh, her and Adam, they were smart. 
They were smart. And so if anybody qualified to be an elder, it should have been Eve. But what Eve done, Eve got out of line, ladies and gentlemen. She got out of line. And when she got out of line, she sinned against Almighty God and she was deceived. She was deceived. And so God, God, see, God want the woman to be protected, ladies and gentlemen. God, in God's perfect will, God want a man to protect the woman. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that they, in, in other words, the woman's supposed to be up under the umbrella of protection. Yeah. Adam was here, and then his wife comes up under the umbrella. Now, I know, I know a lot of ladies, a lot of ladies uh, want to teach, and a lot of them, I mean, they want to be, you know, elders in the church. They want to be preachers and what have you. Uh, but when you see that, when you see a woman uh, preaching in the church, just realize she's in the permissive will of God, not the perfect will of God. Yeah, just realize that. Because see, in Paul's day, uh, uh, some of the people, uh, they was permitting uh, women to teach. But Paul says, I suffer not a woman to teach. Uh, to be the elder teacher, to be the ruler in the church. That word suffer also means permit. Uh, why did Paul use that word permit? Because some people was permitting it. They was permitting it. But Paul says, no, no, I don't do that based on, not, not personal, based on creation. When you go all the way back to God's perfect will, God's perfect will, it should be a man teaching. I didn't mean to labor on that so long, but we need to uh, make sure that we are real, real clear because what you, uh, most of the time people, they look at what they see out in the world and they say, man, this woman here, she can really preach. Boy, she can teach. She can teach. She can teach. Uh, I think I want to be a teacher. You know, when a lady start looking at all these uh, good preachers and what have you, I mean, they can, some of them can even out preach they uh, uh, husband and stuff like that and so but we're going to see tonight performance is not a qualification to be an elder just, just because you can uh, out hoop somebody or out teach somebody don't mean that you qualify to be an elder watch this watch this Let's go a little bit further. Let me kind of speed it up a little bit. You got to be the husband of one wife. Got to be the husband of one wife. And when he says the husband of one wife, we're talking about not polygamy. You can't have three and four wives at the same time. Polygamy. Uh, or as well as being a married man, but you got some ladies just on the side. You're a womanizer. No, no. Uh, and then he talks about being temperate. And temperate uh, means well-balanced. You got to be a well-balanced man. And then you got to be sober-minded. Sober-minded, that means self-control. You got to have some self-control about yourself. If you can't control yourself, then you, you don't need to be trying to be an elder in the church and then good behavior. Do you see that in your Bible? All right, because I'm still coming out of this. I'm just kind of speeding it up. And then given to hospitality. Hospitable. 
Now that means that you open your house up to visitors. You entertain guests at your house. Yeah, yeah, you got to be willing to do that. And particularly, remember in Paul's day, they didn't have no holiday inns and things like that. Uh, they didn't have no roadside uh, uh, rest area when, you know, you, when you're between towns and stuff like that. That was one of the roles of an elder, when I, even when I was a little boy. Uh, uh, my granddad, being a preacher, he used to always have preachers over there at his house, staying at his house and things like that. He believed in being uh, very hospitable and then able to teach. Able to teach. You got to be able to teach. You got to be, uh, and we're looking at Bible doctrine. See, today we look at who can, who can talk the loudest and who got a lit hoop and, you know, uh, a sweet talker and stuff like that. No, that ain't really teaching. He's talking about knowing the Bible. You got to really know your Bible in order to teach. Yeah, because you got to be able to correct people and reprove people and uh, exhort people, and you got to be able to use the Bible to do it. And then number nine, rule your house. You got to be able to rule your own house. The scripture says right here, uh, in verse number four, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man knows not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So in other words, how you rule your house is how you're going to manage the church. If you don't know how to rule your house, then you're not going to be able to manage the church. Yeah. And if your children don't want to obey you, what make you think people at the church wants to obey you? And so uh, one of the ways you know, see, if somebody told me, Pastor, I would like to be an elder there at the church, do you know what I would start doing? I would start looking at the wife, how that person treat his wife, how that person treat his children, and how those children, if, if, if those children uh, kind of frown on their daddy, don't want to hear their daddy, don't want to be around their daddy and stuff like that, then uh, uh, I'm going to put a question mark. I'm going to put a question mark there. Something ain't quite right. Something ain't quite. See, God gives you your family. Your family is the training ground for the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For whatever position you want in the church, God is going to uh, uh, do some training at home. Yeah, yeah. Do some training there. All right. And then he must have a good reputation, must have a good reputation. That's the tenth one, a good reputation. A good reputation, a good reputation. You got to have a good reputation and that's in verse number seven where it said moreover he must have a good report of them which are without. So people in the community, people in the community need to know you as an outstanding citizen. If they, if the people in the community say, no nah, man, this guy here, he's not the husband of one wife. No, he got some other ladies out there on the side. And man, this guy here, uh, he ain't tempered. No, he, he's not tempered. He don't have self-control. He ain't got a good behavior. Uh, so you got to make sure that you got a good reputation in the community. Why is that? Because them the people that you're going to be trying to reach for Christ. You're going to try to win them to Jesus Christ. 
And so you can't go out there be doing the same thing <laughs> that they are doing. You got to be different from them in the way that you walk, in the way that you talk, in the way that you do things. So in other words, you need to be a role model for them. They need to be telling you, Rev, I ain't there yet, but I'm, I'm going to try to, to be like you one day. Yeah, yeah. All right. So that's a person that's got a good reputation when people say, you know, I, I wish I could be like you, Rev. All right. And so those are the ten positive, but I want you to see the five negative because he have five negatives here in this text. Verse, and, and four of them is right there in verse number three where he says, uh, not a uh, scracker. Uh, wait a minute, not given to wine. That's the first one. Not given to wine. In other words, not an alcoholic. Not an alcoholic. Not an alcoholic. And then he says, uh, not a scracker. Uh, that means violence, not violent. You can't be violent. Then number three, not quarrelsome. You can't love the orga. You know, some people just love to argue. You can't love the argue. You can't love the argue. Some people just love a good argument. And then, uh, not a covenant person, or in other words, not a lover of money. That's really what he's talking about. Because he used the expression, not greedy of filthy lucre. When he says not greedy of, in verse 3, not greedy of filthy lucre, he's talking about not a lover of money. And then number 5, not a novice. Or a new convert. All right, oh, we're talking about an inexperienced person, a person that's still wet behind the ears. All right, so we we got the ten positive, uh, blameless, got to be a man, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. Rule your own house, good reputation. And then we looked at the five negative, not an alcoholic. Uh, now notice, uh, let me bring some out where it says not given to uh, wine. Uh, some translation says uh, not given to much wine, not given to much wine. Now, in Paul's day, everybody... Uh, had wine for their table dinner. Yeah, they, were, they had, you know, table wine. But keep in mind, uh, it was watered down. Nobody uh, a drunk just pure uh, grapes juice from the vine that was uh, fermented. No, it was always three parts three parts water, two parts the wine. Yeah, so you always had more water than wine, so it was diluted. Uh, so uh, that this is one, also they had bad water in Paul's day. Uh, they had bad water, and so um, they drunk a lot of wine but it was diluted wine. Now you could get drunk, you could get drunk, but if you was a drunkard, 
then you was disqualified. Now, the wine that we got today, I would just about uh, talk to a guy and I would tell him, listen, uh, we're not so much talking about uh, much wine. You know, a person came to me and said, well, pastor, uh, and I'm interviewing an elder. And they said, well, you know, I don't drink much wine. You know, I don't, I don't drink too much. And I would say, scrack. <laughs> because the wine that we have today, uh, it's docked up. It ain't, it, it ain't like it was back in Bible day. They, they put some stuff in there to even make you uh, become addicted and stuff like that. So I would say, no, uh, you can't be drinking no uh, any wine today. No, 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 because it's, 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 it's totally different. And so, uh, and when he says not given, and then if that person make a big deal out of it, that tells me they done, uh, they are given over to wine. See, the Bible don't want nothing. If you're in leadership position, you don't want nothing influencing your thinking. You don't want nothing. And see, wine will influence how you talk. It influence how you walk. It influence how you act. Yeah, alcoholic beverages will influence you. And you're not supposed to have anything in leadership. Nothing should influence you but the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost should be the one that influenced you. That's why the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost should uh, influence you. All right. And so we looked at uh, not to alcoholic, not violence. You know, if this person here was a wife beater and then he got uh, divorced and remarried and he's a wife beater and he got divorced and remarried, no. No, no, you, you need to fix that before you start trying to talk about being an elder. Yeah, somebody may come in the office there, and the next thing you know, you done went off on that man's wife that came for counseling or something. You got so upset. And so uh, <laughs> um, we can't let nothing like that happen. And then not a love of money and not a new convert. All right, now what I want to do, I want to look right quick at uh, three illustrations, three illustrations of some people that may qualify or may not qualify to be elders. I want to look first of all at Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. And this is the story of the rich young ruler. It says, and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what must I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why call it thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandment, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Oh, I done done all the Ten Commandments. In other words, I qualify. But notice what Jesus says. Then Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing you lack. Go sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come take up thy cross, and follow me. Well, Jesus says, you lack one thing. You thought you had everything, but Jesus says, you lack one thing. In other words, Jesus is testing this man. He's testing him. And the Bible says, and he went away sad at that sin and went away grieved, for he had great possession. He had great possession. Now, 
this man, what was his problem? What, what was it that disqualified him? The thing that disqualified him was right here. He was a lover of money. He, he loved his money more than he loved Jesus. Jesus said, go sell what you have and then come on and follow me. And notice what Jesus said. Most people forget this. He says, and you'll have treasures in heaven. You'll have treasures in heaven. Yeah, in other words, Jesus is telling them where you put your treasures at. Don't put your treasure down here. Why is that? Because moth and dust will corrupt. Thieves will break through and steal. But lay your treasures in heaven where no moth, no dust can corrupt. No thieves can break through or steal. And so, see, whatever you got down here, your money and stuff will preoccupy you. And Jesus didn't want nothing to preoccupy to take your time. And that's the problem with a lot of uh, church people today, they got so God done blessed them so they let their blessings get in the way of their service. Yeah, yeah, that's why a lot of men uh, can't qualify. Uh, I mean, they're good men, they're good men, they're good men, but they don't qualify. Now, I got ahead of myself. I should have asked you the question. Do this man qualify to be an elder? Do he qualify? It's sad to say. Come close. Come, come, come close. It's sad to say. But at a lot of churches, this man would have been sitting on that elder board. <laughs> so, he said, oh, what a, he would have been right there on the elder board. He may have even been the chairman of the elder board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he would have been sitting there. Why is that? Because he ain't got no obvious sins. In his mind, you know, I done kept the Ten Commandments. And when people know that this man got a lot of money, this man, he was rich, and he ain't got no real obvious sins where people can point the finger and blame him, he would have been sitting right there on that elder board. But notice, Jesus knew that this man, he wasn't keeping all the Ten Commandments because he broke that commandment of covetousness. Yeah, yeah. He was into covetousness. He was into possessions and things. He loved his money more than he loved Jesus. In other words, money was his God. Money was his God. And so he, he didn't qualify. He didn't qualify. He didn't qualify. Let's look at somebody else. Let's look at somebody else. And like I say, it's so sad today, ladies and gentlemen, because this man uh, would have been sitting on the board of the average church. He sure would have. And, uh, you know, that's the problem with our churches today. We look at what people are driving. We look at what they got in their pocket. Well, we look at the kind of house they got, and they say, oh, man. And, and a lot of times, we run after those people, and we get them on our board. But notice, this man went away sorrowful, and Jesus didn't even go after him. Did you notice that? We run after folks that Jesus don't run after. And this is why our churches are messed up, ladies and gentlemen, from the flow up, is because we're putting people on these boards that has no business being on the board. All right, let's, let's go on a little bit further. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Verses 24 through 26. Verse 24 through 26. Acts 18, the scripture says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an elegant man and mighty in scripture, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, 
and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only, somebody say only, only the baptism of John. In other words, he was limited. He didn't know that much. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard him, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And so look at the situation. We got this man named Apollos. He was an elegant man. Man, he really knew how to say it. He really knew how to preach. But he was limited in his Bible knowledge. He only knew about the baptism of John. He didn't really know about the baptism of Jesus or the baptism of the Holy Spirit and stuff like that. He didn't really know about a lot of that. And as a result, he was limited. But, but notice, he was drawing a crowd. He was drawing an audience. And the Bible says Priscilla and Aquila, uh, this couple, uh, this married couple, pulled them aside. They didn't embarrass them publicly. They pulled them aside and they talked with them about the Bible and got him back on straight. Got him on straight street. Now, do Priscilla qualify to be an elder? Because she know more than the preacher. She know more than the preacher. She had to pull the preacher aside and whisper in the preacher ear, hey, bro, uh, it's more to this thing than the baptism of John. Yeah, it's more to it. I mean, that was Old Testament. Now you need to come on up to the New Testament. She knew more than the preacher. Do that qualify her because she got the Bible knowledge do she qualify to be an elder? Because she got the Bible knowledge. She know more than the preacher. Huh? Do she qualify to be an elder? No. She's, she don't qualify. Why is that? Because she's not a man. She's got to be a man, and she got to be the husband of one wife. Again, she got to be a man. See, it has nothing to do, ladies and gentlemen, with how much Bible that you know and how smart you is and how you can talk and how you can say it and all of that. No, we got to go by the qualification. God has given us qualification. He told Timothy and Titus, those two pastors, what to look for in building that elder team, in building that elder ministry. It's got to be a man, a husband of one wife. Now, that's the second illustration. Let's go with the third. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 18 to 22. Acts chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. The scripture says, and when Simon, wait a minute, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 13, through 9 through 13. All right. Now keep in mind, Philip then went down there to Samaria and he's got a good juicy revival going on. The, the Bible says in verse 9, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is is the great power of God. And to him they had uh, regards because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorcery. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they was baptized, both men's and women's. Then Simon himself 
believe also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and sign which was done. And so he was fascinated with power. This man, he was a witch doctor. We see a witch doctor here. This man was a witch doctor. He had bewitched a lot of people. But when Philip came down and Philip started saving these people through the power of God and working miracles and stuff, this man uh, accepted Christ as his personal savior. Or he made a profession of faith and he accepted Christ as his personal savior. And then he started going with hanging out with Philip and watching Philip perform them signs and wonders and miracles. Now, my question is, do this man qualify to be an elder of the church? Do he qualify to be an elder of the church? Uh, I mean, he's into power. And now uh, it looks like he done got saved and everything. He's, he's following Philip and everything. Uh, can he be an elder? Can he be an elder? Because Philip going to have to leave. Uh, can he appoint him as being an elder there of the church. I mean, because uh, this man already know how to, you know, get a crowd and what have you. So uh, do he qualify? Well, let's go a little bit further. Uh, let's look down here at verse number 18. And when, because Peter and John came down and they started laying hands on people and the people start getting the Holy Ghost. Now, for some reason, God did not give them the Holy Ghost at the time that they got saved. Now, today, whenever a person receives Jesus as a personal Savior, they get the Holy Ghost. Uh, but back then, I believe one of the reasons that God did not give them the Holy Ghost is because, remember, Samaria and Jerusalem, they kind of had a little competition going on. So if the people would have said that uh, 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 Peter and John, uh, we got saved upon the day ministry and the Holy Ghost came upon the Peter and John. Uh, Y'all ain't got no uh, Holy Ghost cause Peter and John didn't even come over there. And so I believe this is why God sent Peter and John there to lay hands on people. So this is the same thing that happened in Jerusalem can happen also in Samaria. And so, uh, but notice this here in verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the land on her hand, the apostles' uh, hands, the Holy Ghost were given, he offered money to them, saying, give me also this power that on whosoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said to him, thy money perish with thee. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this, thy wickedness. And pray, God, if perhaps uh, the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Well, that answered your question right there. Did this man qualify to be an elder? No, he didn't qualify to be no elder. Number one, he didn't qualify to be an elder because he was a novice. He was a novice. And keep in mind, a novice is a new convert. And this man, was he really converted? I don't think that he was really saved. Yeah, even though he made a profession of faith, he didn't, number one, he didn't have the Holy Ghost. But notice, Peter, he uses language that you use when you're dealing with an unbeliever. Notice what Peter says again, uh, verse 20. But Peter said to him, thy money perish with thee. That word perish is the same word that's used in John 3, 16. God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believe in him should not perish. In other words, go to hell. 
And notice, this is what Peter is basically saying. Peter said unto him, thy money go to hell with thee. That's what Peter is saying right here. <laughs> to hell with your money. And go to hell with your money. That's basically what Peter is saying. He said, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money, thou hast neither part nor a lot in this matter. You ain't even saved. That's, that's basically what Peter seemed to be implying. You don't e even have a part in this mission of salvation. You need to get saved. That's basically what Peter is saying. Verse 22, repent therefore. That's, again, that's a word that's dealing with salvation. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness. And so this is one of the reasons that you, that you don't want to lay uh, hands uh, on a new convert because you don't even know if they're really saved yet. You don't even know if they're really saved. Even though they may have, see people are impressed with power. People are impressed with power. People are impressed with uh, how people speak. They're impressed with money. But we got to be impressed with God. Yeah. All right. So uh, how should we apply this lesson? How should we apply this lesson? Don't lay hands. Don't lay hands on no man suddenly. And then number two, don't judge. By outward appearance. Don't be looking at what a person have. Oh, this person got a lot of money. Uh, uh, well, we need to get, let them come on and be on the board. Uh, uh, they got good jobs or they got good connection. I mean, uh, um, they know this person and they know that person. No, no, don't judge by outward appearance. See, all of these things here are inward character. All of that blameless, the husband and one wife, temperate, sober-minded, good behavior. All of this is on the inside. So don't judge by outward appearance. Don't look at the outside. you got to look at the inside. And then the last thing, let the Bible be your guide. Let the Bible be your guide. Don't let people's opinion be your guide. Don't even let your opinion be your guide, but let the Bible, let the Bible, let this book right here, let this Bible be your guide. All right, that's our Bible lesson for tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this word. Take this